let's get started. Sure. This is a partner. Um, animal advocate, animal law expert, retired, retired animal. You're too young to be retired. <laughs> a rights lawyer. Your I, I did retire a little young. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Your new book is a voice for animals. Yeah, a here it is. Movement that provides dignity and compassion for animals. That's right. All right, now let's talk about that. A social movement that provides dignity and compassion for animals. Tell me what that's about. So the book is really about elevating the status of animals and showing people that animals are important to human lives. And the relationship is mutual in a sense. So we share this earth with animals and they deserve stronger legal protection and elevated status in society. You launched the first animal law firm in Canada in 2014, is that correct? That's correct, yes. 2014, that feels like yesterday. I can't believe there was no other law advocacy group or law firm for relevant to animals, for animals and mediation practices prior to that. So I'm shocked that we haven't had animal welfare and laws come together sooner than like what you did in 2014. And even now, I'm st it's, I'm, we're finally seeing some movement with animal protection. I've been involved in the world of animal welfare for many, many years, but you know, it's always been in this silo with people that... Um, are vegans or vegetarians uh, believe that animals are sentient beings and they would um, not be eating their dog, so why eat a chicken? So those things, and, and you know, it, it's different for everybody, but I'm just shocked that animal welfare has not had a, an organization like lawyers behind it until very recently. So can you talk about why you got into that? Yeah, so those are all very good observations that you've made, and um, I completely agree with you. It is quite shocking. Um, from my perspective, I had always wanted to help animals, wanted loved animals my whole life, and when I went to law school and also was volunteering at a shelter, I realized what inadequacies existed for animals and just decided to take a leap and start this law practice without much expectation. And it surprisingly grew into a very busy practice. What aspect of it was busy? What part of the, um, who was coming to you? Who were your clients? So mostly my clients were pet parents. Uh, most of them were going through separations, divorces, and uh, wanted to find out about the legal rights of their pets. That's interesting. And you're, yeah, in, Canada. So the, yeah. you're in Canada. You practice mainly in Canada. Are, are you aware of the laws in the U.S. or is your focus just mainly Canada? Yeah, I, I am actually. My book is written for a U.S. and Canadian audience. Um, I think that it's it's somewhat similar and I did live in California so I, I have uh, some experience in the states as well so I am familiar with the laws in the states uh, with related to animals and do do highlight that in my book so if the audience is American then I'm happy to share that awesome so who were you, so it was mainly people uh, looking for custody of their pets or how to split custody it was like dealing with kids essentially yeah that's yeah. what it started and then it evolved into all kinds of different areas of law which was really interesting so for example uh there were veterinary malpractice suits there were insurance claims um people that had their dog seized from animal control so if it, there was a dog bite incident um there were uh breeder disputes uh, there were so many different areas of the law that uh, affect animal rights that it, it turned into an all-encompassing practice that serviced uh, different types of cases in, in animal rights. 
That's cool. So what do you think was your greatest accomplishment in animal law while you were practicing? I think my greatest accomplishment was to be able to make people more aware that animal rights are important and that there are lawyers and people that are willing to defend animals in court and to give them a voice. Okay, let's talk about, I, this is something that really hits home for me here, puppy mills and backyard breeders. Um, there is very little oversight yes. with uh, sales of animals. And with eliminating a lot of states are finally, uh, hopefully this happens, it just happened in New York, um, stopping the sale of animals in pet stores. So pet stores are gonna have to revamp their business models, the ones that were selling animals. And pet industry executive, like the pet, uh, pet advocacy network um, pushes the opposite direction. They push for keeping animal sales at retail. And some of the things that they have mentioned is that they can keep better control of the process. So I'm a little confused about how they can keep control of the process when they don't even know how many people out there are actually breeding and selling animals. Can you talk about this segment of the pet industry for me, can you shine some light on what's happening with puppy mills and what the those advocacy networks, the groups that are pro pet stores and buying animals? I'm okay with quality breeders that are um, keeping breed integrity and they take care of their animals. They take the animals back. You know, that, that's a different world, but uh, commercial breeding. And true puppy mills, people that do it just for profit and don't care about animals, there are too many. And the controls are, there are no controls. I should actually say, there are no controls. And there's no government body overseeing any of this. Majority of them are not licensed. I want your perspective on what's happening in this world when it comes to this industry, the puppy, the buying and selling of animals. Yeah, so the puppy mill industry is a, is a very profitable, lucrative industry, as you're probably aware. Uh, you're very familiar with what is happening, actually. Um, so I'm very impressed um, at what you know about it. Um, I believe that the problem really comes down to the idea that animals are for sale, that they're disposable, that they are um, making people money. And as you said, they're largely unregulated industries. So the recent uh, pet store ban in New York, for example, that is helping to shut down some of these puppy mills. Um, and that's a good thing. It's happened in a few states and it seems to be becoming more commonplace. However, the backyard breeders, quote unquote, the, um, the puppy mill uh, industry is, is hard to control uh, without regulation and then without enforcement. So that's part of the issue that, that goes to the deep root of the problem of disposable pets, which again, I do talk about in my book, um, as long as animals are sold and people make money, then their value diminishes and they're seen as commodities. If that goes to the root of the whole issue of puppy mills, puppy mill breeding, and animals being sold, animals for sale. How come there are, are no legislative or regulatory efforts? Um, I mean, I keep reading and trying to figure out if there are any. But my concern is that there are lobbyists and um, organizations that prefer that there be no guidelines. So it can be a free-for-all. It is lucrative. I, I, I understand that. But 
as far as laws come into place and regulatory bodies, how, what can you do as someone who understands animal laws and um, can impact change? What would you do if you had an opportunity to create a different world than what we're, what we're seeing right now? What I would do uh, on an individual basis to start is I would adopt animals from shelters. People don't always understand that that, that action in itself helps reduce puppy mills, helps reduce the breeders. I mean, if every single person that wanted to have a pet chose to adopt an animal as opposed to purchase an animal from uh, an animal shelter or a reputable rescue organization that works with shelters, we would not have this supply and demand issue. I mean, that's what it comes down to, unfortunately, economics, believe it or not. Yeah. And if there were less people purchasing their pets from breeders and from the puppy mill industries, that would certainly reduce the demand. And so that's what I would do on an individual basis. Um, on a more collective scale and uh, from an animal advocacy perspective, I would be an advocate and I would try to have petitions going around, which I've done, by the way, and I know a lot of people do. Um, and as a collective, uh, have voices heard together, get together with other organizations. And I would approach my government officials and I would try to pass laws that would um, provide some kind of legislation that would prevent these industries from continuing to exist on such a large scale. I don't see, I, I know people are doing that and I see- People are trying, yeah. Trying. trying. How come the success rate sucks? Well, that's Why a great question. <laughs> I would, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, as I said uh, earlier, it, it's a very lucra lucrative business, you see? So it's gonna take more than just um, a few voices and the government officials, people in, in government to pass these laws and then to enforce them. And so that's gonna take some time. The good news is, is that we're, we are starting to um, recognize and realize that puppy mills and you know the sale of puppies in pet stores is not a positive thing for animals. And so these changes are already happening. So that's the good news. Um, from a wider perspective, it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time. These, these movements, this is a movement. And we, even you and I having this conversation is helping to raise awareness, public awareness. People don't know, a lot of people don't know what's really happening. You and I know, because we're in it. But that's that's what needs let's to happen. Let's talk about let's talk about what's really happening. You know, I, I'm curious. The other side always has arguments. And yeah, I have to see the other side because I, I'm on one side. <laughs> and <laughs> they always have arguments that support the continuation of breeding facilities, commercial breeding facilities. And I was also I was at an event where they were advocating for commercial breeding facilities that would be self-regulated. Mm. And those things scare the daylights out of me. And here mm. I am watching huge pet advisor, pet, pet group of pet advocacy group that's very well known in the pet industry talking about this and promoting it and pushing to make it happen. Um, and one of the people speaking about it was an ex AS, the head of ASPCA, Ed Sayers you know, who was a breeder, you yeah. know. Um, so, you know, I sit there and I say, this is really twisted. Yeah. There is a lot of layers and there's infiltration of toxicity within the organizations that are trying to do good. Yeah. So you know, that's why the process is so slow. Yeah. As a, as 
an, an animal advocate and a lawyer. Um, how do you push these things legally faster to out these the other side to kind of bring their colors to the surface where the consumers who don't know because there are they so many know. consumers that don't know their neighbor gets a, a pug a doodle or a crap a doodle yeah. or whatever yeah. doodle yeah and, right and, yep. and nothing against the animals I, no. I feel horrible for those animals it's the stupidity of the humans who say they did their research yes and the research was just that their friend got the animal from a specific breeder that was really great yeah literally yeah so how do we out those members who have infiltrated the better organizations who are trying to do good because i think there's a lot of there's a lot of messiness and because animals can't talk yes we have chosen to only listen to bits and pieces and I don't even know what I'm asking you anymore, Susanna. That's okay. Because <laughs> I'm yapping on and on. My concern is that there's a lot of lies and manipulation. And on a legal side, what can we do to bring that those issues to the surface? So the consumer stops putting money into these organizations that these people want to keep going. That's a great, another great question that you have, and I love your passion, and I, I feel the same way. So, so we, we share the same, if I can say, frustration. Um, yeah. And an example will be the pandemic pets, for example. So during the pandemic, everybody just about decided to get a dog. And what they did, unfortunately, was many of them went online. Mm -hmm. They purchased their dog. They listened to their neighbor, saw their neighbor who went to a breeder, a reputable breeder. And it was a spiral effect. And what happened, which is what I've noticed as an animal advocate, and now I'm an executive director of an Etobicoke Humane Society, the programs and operations um, and so what we've seen is an influx of these dogs being surrendered at animal shelters. And the reason this is happening is because of what you said earlier. People don't know. They're not aware. The consumer doesn't understand that by continuing to purchase your pets, you're actually helping to perpetuate this idea of animal disposability because these shelter animals are dying. And so to answer your question, I would say that it starts with the social awareness uh, of the mainstream, first of all. And when people understand, so what we need to do is, is just to educate people, to be compassionate. That's why I say dignity and compassion for animals. It starts with educating, building awareness, and then we move to change the laws, you see? Because until the public really understands what they're doing, it's going to continue. And that's what I've noticed. And that's what I try to do as an animal advocate is I try to educate people to understand that this idea of animal disposability comes from their individual choices. Okay, I understand that. I lack patience because we're dealing with lives and yeah. lives that are silent. And yeah. the um, side that, the other side is incredibly loud and boisterous. Like yeah. there is in South Carolina, a friend of mine sent me, um, an email that in South Carolina, they're having a bully uh, breed event and it's bulldogs, um, pit bulls, and it's a couple of DJs are playing loud music and these little uh, oddly uh, red um, pit bulls with massive heads and little bodies 
I mean, these are distorted animals, yeah. right? We're yeah. breeding sickness. We the are. veterinary community is suffering because of the problems being caused by money hungry motherfuckers. Excuse my language. Of course. I'm yeah. really angry about what's happening and it is exposed all over in social media and yeah. it's made okay. TikTok, um, Facebook, Instagram, you can sell puppies yeah. on, so you can talk about, oh, look at the new uh, batch, batch, because they're not cookies, people. Yeah. Look at the new batch of Frenchies, mm -hmm. right? Merle, blue-eyed monsters. I mean, yeah. the things that they're breeding. And then, you know, people go and do, um, you know, they try to raise funds to cover medical expenses for animals that are sick that they chose to pay seven to $10,000 for. So when I see all this on social media, how do you bring social awareness when the other side is so loud? They all we talk about when we, when we do social awareness, as you call it, we talk, we see the sick animals, we see the rescue groups saying, this animal sick, this animal suffering, this animal what was sleeping in a bed of chemicals and its body and skin peeling, and we found it. Or humane society and the um, other animal groups go into puppy mills, like the Bissell mm -hmm. Foundation, right? And they clear out because these, the puppy mills, the wool mills have become overburdened and they don't know what to do. They clear out the animals. Um, but they have to sign an NDA, right? Yeah. Or yeah. they're not breaking down the makeshift cages that these animals were left in to suffer. So they're allowing the perpetuation of the problem to continue. They are. Where do we stop? As an well, advocate, where do we stop? Have you done yeah. these organizations like the Humane Society and the Bissell Foundation? Stop that. Don't sign the NDA. Don't yeah. sign the NDA. Yeah. You can't put the top 100 group out there. Yeah. Who cares? People yeah. are still buying from them because they're they advertising. Are. So what we're doing is not, I don't think social awareness of the mainstream is really doing it. I think we're, we're blind. We gotta be aggressive in a different way. And well, I, I think that, out what that is. yeah, I think that um, it, it starts, I believe with the social awareness and it, it and unfortunately takes time. I'm impatient too. And I have been doing this for even before I started my law firm. So we say 2014, but honestly, I've been doing this since I was a teenager. So it's been a long road, you know, so it's sometimes I feel um, a little tired, right? Because I feel like I'm trying to make a difference, um, but we just keep do we just keep going. And we realize, you know, we can't change the world right away. We, we have to continue to, change perceptions and i say educate educate the young um more and more people are thankfully becoming aware that um you know buying animals period buying animals so i stop there perpetuate animal disposability because the person then even if it's unconscious views the animal it, to some degree as a commodity, as an object. And that's what we're trying to, we're trying to move away from that. So yes, it's very frustrating. It's very controversial. Uh, there are dog auctions that I've become aware of where rescues go in, they purchase these dogs at full price. So it's, it's unbelievable. Then they use their resources to then try to help those animals that, for example, have health issues, which a lot of breeder dogs, unfortunately, or some, I don't want to say a lot, have. And so it's, again, it's this vicious cycle. So I, I do go back to social awareness because society needs to understand what is happening. So these conversations that we're having are important. And then having the politicians on board and passing laws that shut down puppy mills that is super 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 important the pet store the pet store ban that is good that's a good thing so we are on the right track 
So the pet store ban is a good thing, but it's that thing. doesn't change the animals being sold online. There's barely, the USDA barely does any oversight with actual licensed facilities. That's right. So That's right. You have these backyard breeders. I'm in yes. New York. Yeah. When I drive out east on Long Island, I see little signs on fences, puppies for sale. Yeah. A couple of times I tried to climb fences and look and see what was going on. One was crazy dilapidated. I took pictures and sent mm -hmm. sent photos to the police department. Nothing happened. When I went back there two weeks later, the sign was taken down and um, they also had cameras all along. They spent the money on the cameras. Are they spending yeah. money on actually taking care of the animals and their living areas? No, but they'll put money into the cameras because they don't want anyone seeing what they're doing. So there is a, an incredibly barbaric side to the online animal sales network. And for consumers to continue buying and believing that it's okay, out of sight, out of mind, is their way of dealing with it. It's not okay. And I don't think we're talking about that enough. I don't think- No, we're no, we're not. And, and actually, sure. I'm gonna say that I'm very surprised uh, even friends and family, believe it or not, uh, are not aware of what is happening, number one, and what they're doing by supporting these businesses. So it goes down to the laws changing. And that, unfortunately, is going to take some time. So we started with the pet laws stores. Changing doesn't mean laws changing doesn't mean laws will be um, anyone will be overseeing those, uh, keeping those laws in place. We yes. Laws. So there's, so the laws change and then, right. and then enforceability has to come into place. Right. So right. I'm going to just jump, if that's okay with you to uh, a topic that I think is relevant to this conversation. Please. So if you just bear with me for a minute, you'll understand. Um, so animals are regarded as personal property in the laws. And Again, I'm just trying to delve to the root of the issue so that we can really understand what needs to happen from the ground up. So there are the good news is, so I'm a good news person, <laughs> believe it or not, that's how, um, that's how I stay positive and motivated. Otherwise, I would feel frustrated. So the good news is, is that the laws are slowly starting to change. For example, in California, in Alaska, in certain states, Pets' interests are being considered in divorce cases. Pets' best interests, similar to a child's interests in, in divorce cases, in family law cases. That's really, really good because judges are slowly starting to see animals as more than property. And what that means is that their interests are starting to be considered. Uh, another example, if we look around the world in Spain, the best interests of animals are being considered. There are countries now that recognize animals as sentient. For example, the UK, so in England, laws have been passed. And so as we see these changes slowly starting to happen, people are becoming more aware and more interested. I'm going to say that interested is, is, uh, is important, that animals being bred as commodities doesn't align with society's values. And so when more people start to understand what you and I understand, they're not gonna support these businesses as much. And then the, the politicians will be on board because the politicians need votes and they have power to change laws. And then when laws change, then enforceability should come in place, there should be fines, there should be regulation. And I'm excited that the pet store ban, for example, in New York is starting that wave. So it is happening slowly, it is, it is, but it's gonna take more time and more effort. I appreciate 
the layers that you just laid out for me. I hope that makes sense because I needed to go to the to the root of the problem in order for us to understand what needs to happen on a larger scale. And it will. It will. I do believe it will happen. I do. I I appreciate it because you know, you have people like me who are incredibly passionate and want to just you get are. it done, right? Yeah. We want to get it done. We have all the information. Yeah. However, um, we have a lot of humans in this world who don't see the way the world the way I do or you do or other people in our shoes. So we have to adjust to what their perception is. And That's you right. completely put that into place. And I so appreciate that and the same thing um when it comes to uh food and eating meat we see that you know we have to change the perception of society as a whole we can't just throw it on say you're bad for eating that's right say you can't do that you know no um so yeah i i hear what you say and i absolutely appreciate the perspective thank you yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, and you said it really well. I mean, it's it's really important to step back to see from other people's point of views that they simply don't know. They don't understand. Um, and when you talk about where food comes from, again, similarly, we can't lecture. Uh, I find that people just shut down. So if I start, when I started, I was really, really enthusiastic and excited and thought that everyone would go vegan and go to the shelters. And that's not happening yet, yet. Um, (laughs) So I've learned, I've learned to try to share with them the great things, the amazing accomplishments of even going vegan one day a week, how that helps reduce animal agriculture, helps climate change, helps the world in yep. substantial ways, and then bring it into their health. Oh, you know what? If you go plant-based, did you know that there's so many health benefits? So similar to the puppy mills is, is again, allowing them to be on their own journey, but doing our best to educate them on what's really happening because they just don't know. So many people want to help. They love animals and they love their pets. And if they just understood that, you know, not supporting these industries will help to shut them down eventually, they'd probably do it, believe it or not. Yeah, I I do believe it. Um, And I know I can't rush the process. Yeah. It's hard to watch the suffering. It's hard. It's hard to watch these wonderful people who have the best interests of animals and you know in their actions and everything they do go in and pull and rescue and um try to expose it to the rest of us and we see this dark side over and over again it becomes exhausting right it becomes exhausting it's almost like i'd rather put blinders on just live my life yeah. Right. So when yeah. we put this spin that you just it's not even a spin, if we change the perspective and yeah. then able to make that choice themselves. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's tough to do. I know it is. It is. Yeah. And another thing that I've I've come to realize is that it's important to walk the walk. So sure. for example, um recently we adopted a uh german shepherd mixed breed puppy from the shelter that i uh, volunteer and i love taking that dog for a walk and telling people sharing with them when they ask where did i get the dog oh i got this puppy at a shelter really Mm -hmm. i kind of get sometimes get stares and people for the most part will say good for you good for you somehow deep down inside they know that it's a good thing to adopt animals from shelters. And so this puppy, I don't have him here because he's a little bit, he's a little bit of a puppy, right? So he'd, he'd be a little, uh, yeah. you're rambunctious, that's right. Um, but I love sharing his story because it's, it's showing people that there are wonderful animals in shelters that actually have, some of them have less health problems people save money. I mean, some of these breeder animals cost a lot of money 
And some of them just end up in the shelter for whatever reason. People pass away. People get mm -hmm. divorced. I mean, people move away um, and or they can't deal with puppies. Yeah, or they lose their income. They can't afford. They or they lose their, their income. income. Yeah, and these yeah. yeah, and these animals end up in the shelter. So that's another way that I found is walk the walk. You know, um, educate people about shelter animals. Uh, share on social media. Um, adopt an animal yourself, and encourage right. friends and family. And then it, it's a wave. It's a wave of people jumping on the bandwagon of not supporting these industries, first of all, and then yeah. working toward the laws that you're absolutely right. It's an unregulated industry. There is no oversight. It's unbelievable. Yet I believe that in 10 years, I'm gonna throw it out at you now. Go ahead. <laughs> things, will, things will change. For the better? For the better. Yeah, absolutely. I do believe that. I mean, when I see I like 2014 uh, wasn't that long ago, but it kind of was. And when I see what's happened now, it's so exciting to see all these laws changing that are finally starting to recognize animals, best interests, animals as sentient beings, animals as more than personal property, animals as more than commodities or objects animals as living breathing beings that's hmm. what i believe is happening uh to society to understand that animals deserve better okay i i want to believe you i really okay. do <laughs> okay <laughs> i want to believe you i do want to clarify a few things sure um puppy mills pet stores commercial breeders versus um Breeders that are breeding for integrity, yes. that are that will only breed a certain number of litters, that take care of the moms and dads, that have them for life. It's a very different world. It there is. are people who are who want to have specific breeds. I, I mean, I have have an ex who only wanted shepherds, purebred shepherds, and same breeder, and the consistently genetic testing. Animals were always healthy, lived long lives, and, um, and and the breeder stopped breeding as well, you know, after a certain time period. I got all my animals at the shelters. It's what people tend to want is that certain look and image that is uh, made popular, again, on social media. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, how can we get these mega companies mm. that have huge influence on the public mm. to um, be part of the change for good instead of being okay with taking money from these advertisers that are yeah. helping perpetuate the bad? So I would say we need people like you and I in those in those industries to speak up and to educate and to stand up for, again, shelter animals, for animals that really need a voice. And that's what would help, I believe, to change these attitudes and the system itself okay. right so we need we need animal lovers we need the animal advocates um as an example there's a few celebrities that are doing great work at vocalizing at making people more aware um, of the issues um but and there are celebrities that are doing badly as well and are there are frenchies and they're there putting are. it out there to there their are. thousands of so yeah. Those are the ones who actually buy the ad space yes, yes. on social media. The ones that are doing good don't exactly buy the ad space. They don't pay. They just use their voice. And I don't mean to um, minimize their no, voice. Of course, but, of course. But there's a lot of money that these organizations are making. And um, these animals are essentially being bred in puppies. They're, they are puppies. They're coming from puppies. So, I mean, seriously, 
do we go to uh, the head of Meta, whatever his name is, can't stand him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, does this go back to government and government over does. Sex? It does. It does. So it does go back to government. Gonna take it does. Okay. It has to go back to government and it has to go into legislation, right? So things, these, yes, these, these problems, right, do have to be regulated. And at the same time, I am keep repeating the word to you, awareness. Because I believe that people, for the most part, people that I've met do care about animal welfare and rights. I'm very, very positively surprised and my heart is filled when I realize how many people really care and how many people just don't know. So with these mega companies, I mean, until the laws are in place, this will continue. And then going back to what you were saying about breeders, yes, there are there are breeders uh, that are ethical, that care. And I have a hard time. I actually, so I'm pulling up my book again. I, I talk about you know, the importance of not supporting breeders. I'm going to say even those in a sense. And I speak in my book about my experience having purchased pets from pet stores, not knowing. Again, thinking that I knew, purchasing our, our shepherd who's still alive. She's almost 12, so not that long ago, from a breeder. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband wanted, like your, your um, partner, a, a purebred and a good temperament. And um, again, just didn't know at the time um, what's happening to the shelter dog. So yeah. it, it's, it's controversial because I don't want to say anything too negative because I know that some of these breeders, they really do care. And you know they're very passionate. Um, what that ha what happens though is that it, it it perpetuates animal disposability, unfortunately, while there's still animals dying in shelters. You're right. um, and we're talking about over a million, over a million die annually, um, according to Best Friends Animal Society. I mean, it's just it's just a big problem, and so it's supply and demand. So as long as we're continuing to breed animals, and animals end up in shelters we're perpetuating this problem of animal disposability. And, and there are purebreds in shelters. There are. There's tons and tons, tons of them. Tons and tons and tons. And there are lots of purebred rescue groups. If you want there a purebred, are. you yes, don't need to buy. Even That's from a right. Breeder. Absolutely. That's yep, right. I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Um, so what do you think is next what happens next how do we the supporters of good yes all gain one voice how do we become one voice instead of so scattered because we are a bit scattered aren't we're we? a bit scattered yeah we're we are um we join these organizations that are trying to change the laws and we we continue to sign these petitions that go around. There are there are banning puppy mill petitions that I see online that mm -hmm. I post from time to time. And we align ourselves with like-minded individuals and organizations that are trying to make changes. And we we write to our government officials, to our politicians that are interested in animal welfare. There are quite a few of them. And then we, we help pass laws. We ourselves can um, become politicians if, we, if that's something that's important. We can become animal lawyers, right? We need more of those. Mm -hmm. um, and so we continue to align ourselves with our values and then I always say there needs to be an action step. So yes. again, these petitions do help. I've seen laws pass. And again, until these industries are regulated, they will continue. So we need to be the change. And we are, and we are slowly but surely we are. That being said, I mean, there's always gonna be problems it right like that's something that we can also accept to some extent um but there will come a time i believe when when 
you know, shelter euthanasia will come to an end and these animal shelters can be converted to sanctuaries and places of protection. I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I am hopeful. I yeah. Know. I mean, when I see uh, what's happened yeah. in the last decade, I mean, it's just so exciting. The fur bans, right? So that's one thing. These, the pet store bans, um, pets best interest being considered in cases. Um, then the Supreme Court ruling um, for the for the pigs, that case with the pigs well, having yeah, more well, space, well, which, yeah. yeah, which again, that's right. That's right. And it may not seem like enough, but we're seeing changes. And that's yeah. what's good. And that's what's really good. And you and I having this conversation and sharing this on social media and educating the young, right? Because the young, like my children, they have different opinions than some people of my generation mm -hmm. because they're becoming more aware. Definitely. That's, so that's really cool. Maybe. So for example, uh, it may seem small, but it was a big deal to me. I went for a walk with my puppy. So my, my new shelter puppy, and I went into the forest and there's a school there in, in the ravine where close to where I live. And there were a bunch of kids that were on break and they all kind of just gathered around the dog. And I was so surprised to know and learn how much they were already aware of shelter dogs and of these issues. Yeah, and that was really cool because I, I was unaware as well of how, how much they know. Oh, that's awesome. I love yeah. hearing. So that's going into true. schools, right? So when children are still young and trying to educate them on the issues um, of animal rights and what they can do. Because people want to help, but they oftentimes don't know what to do. Yeah, and we need to do it with kindness so we don't make kindness. anyone feel bad about that's the right. choices they made. So the next time around, it's done out of love on their end as well, uh, instead of not knowing. That's so, right. yeah, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Susanna Gardner, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I thank you love so much, having Pat. you. And uh, a voice for animals is at Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Yes, yes everywhere. Um, every bookstore. It's a beautiful oh, book. Perfect. Turn it thank around. You. Turn it upside down. Turn it around. Around. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, many of these issues and I also give people an action plan so I don't but, want anybody yeah, to feel that. like Go they back. they can't uh I give people an action plan in my book so I talk about many of these issues that you and I have talked about and then I leave people with what can you do to help I love that that is awesome I'm gonna ask you a question are you gonna are you going to be doing like an audible version? A lot of people prefer to listen. Oh, good, good point. Yeah, version. I will. I will be doing that. Yes. Yes, you're awesome. right. That is that yeah. is something on my on my to-do list. Cool. Because I, I don't see too many animal related books yeah. on Audible when I look yes. it up. I'm like, why not? If people good idea. listen, I think they would reading can be sometimes emotional like at bedtime yeah. you, you read and you don't yeah. want to go to bed with those feelings of animal yeah. suffering or even what do I That's have to right. do next but listening as you're out for a walk with your dog or in the yeah. dog park and the person I think the way they would relate to their next steps would be very different than just sitting there reading and I love reading because and I do it I yeah. read to capture words and to connect to next steps and to hold on to feelings yeah. from a book. Sometimes books on animal advocacy and animal welfare, I get a little uncomfortable with reading. Yeah. I rather yeah. listen to it as I'm taking a walk because it triggers my next steps. What do I want to do? Okay. What do I want to do with my podcast? Where do I want to go? How do I want to help animals? Yeah. So it would be cool if you did an audible. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And the, the good news is, is that I really try to share a lot of stories, like it's filled with heartfelt, I'm going to say mostly uplifting stories, and then yeah. what needs to happen, I believe, from my expertise and my experience in this area, um, to help move the, this, this movement, the animal rights movement forward. Um, so I try to make it heartfelt, it's filled with stories, 
uh, rescue, um, showing how animals have emotions through the documented research to really um, awaken people, awaken readers to realize that animals are not objects, they're not commodities, they're complex creatures with feelings, emotions, every single one of them. So that's what is great about it. And uh, yes, I, I'm planning to do an audible book as well. So Fabulous. that's really a really great idea. I agree. Fabulous. Well, I will read your book. That's the first thing. Okay. I'll do. <laughs> I actually re read the whole key. Um, you had it on a, 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 an electronic format. So yeah. I read that and I was like, wow, oh, this good. is awesome. Oh, thank you. Really awesome. So Susanna Gardner, animal advocate, animal law expert. Can't believe you're a retired animal rights <laughs> lawyer. I still say that. And uh, your book is A Voice for Animals, a social movement yes, that, that provides dignity and compassion for animals. Thank yes. you for doing this today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work you do. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank and you. you as well. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me.